Welcome to Main Street Mavericks Radio, bringing you insights and strategies of exceptional Main Street businesses serving friends and neighbors in their communities as educators and advocates for their customers. Here's your host, marketing and lead generation strategist and best-selling author, Donna Gunter. Welcome to another episode of Main Street Mavericks Radio. I'm your host, Donna Gunter. This episode is sponsored by BizSmart Media, who helps attract ideal clients on autopilot as a standout expert in your industry. Today we have with us Liz Winman, UK's premier classic and vintage car rallies organizer. Liz is the founder and director of Rally Round, as well as a genuine mo- motorsport enthusiast. Having previously followed Superbikes, Liz has been involved with historic cars for many years alongside her husband and stepson, both of whom compete. Liz has driven on several events ranging from the Pyrenees Rally to the 2010 Peking to Paris Rally. It was those experiences that inspired her to set up her own rally company, focusing on customer care and relaxed competition allowing ample time to socialize and explore the wonders of the world. Liz originally trained as a research biochemist, but subsequently ran a successful hospitality business, organizing more than 150 events from weddings and art exhibitions to music festivals and fireworks displays. An active member of the Royal Geographical Society, she also has extensive experience in traveling and working abroad. Rally Round success is based on her superb organizational skills, extensive experience in business management, customer service, marketing, common sense, humor, enthusiasm, and spirit of adventure. Welcome to the show, Liz. Hi there. Thanks very much. That's uh, quite an introduction. <laughs> well, it sounds like you've had quite a life. Well, yeah, I've um, been very lucky. About- very lucky. <laughs> it sounds like it. Well, tell us a bit about Rally Round Limited and how you are helping your participants in these rallies. Um, okay, well, as you touched on in the uh, introduction, I've done various rallies with my husband. Generally, I navigate and he drives because he's uh, well, trained and much better driver than me. And um, on these rallies, I, I personally felt that there was room for improvement in that I wanted to have a look at some of the places we were traveling through. And so I wasn't sure if I was the only one who felt that, but uh, it became apparent I wasn't. So one of the things that I think we're different with Rally Round and what we do help people do is it's not just about the car and the competition and the driving days. It's also about, you know, looking at it from a travel perspective and what people might like to enjoy and see in some of these fantastic countries that the rallies drive through. So that's number one was that was that's one reason was to actually organize it so that you didn't just do the racing and the cars but you actually had time to enjoy the culture or the food markets or the architecture so that's that's the big thing that started me into looking to run a rally well that sounds fascinating you know because i'm from the u.s i don't know much about these rallies and if we have this type of event in the u.s i'm pretty ignorant about that fact i've really never heard of it here in the states when you talk about the race, talk a little bit of tell me a little bit about what that means. Are they actually racing from destination to destination? Well, we um as a company we have to run under the jurisdiction of the FIVA and so we adhere to all their rules. So when the rally is on a road going from destination to destination, we we have a very strict code of conduct including, you know, actual maximum speed. So we do something which is called regularity or jogularity. So you have Um, a set time by which to get from point A to point B or you have to drive at a set speed and then the speeds can change and sort of the maths becomes a bit difficult so you maybe set a speed for the first 5k and then it changes to a slightly different average speed so on the road it's not racing it's um it's quite demure and uh under control it's more about uh communication really between the crew then when we get somewhere and there is a racetrack, then uh, it is a bit more about uh, a bit of speed in a safe sort of managed environment. 
But again, it doesn't mean the fastest car around the track wins. Um, we might say that you can only, you know, we'll look at the track and clerk of the course will judge it and say, you know, it's a very fast track. Let's allow them to go, you know, three quarters of the way around and then we'll put something there like a, a stride the line. You literally have to stop your car. You have a marshalling point and then you continue. So it isn't, although we say circuits and racing, it isn't, you know, helmets and harness and, and that level of racing. It should be a good well, mix, could, though. It should be a good mix. I couldn't imagine, you know, if I had, you know, I'm not a car enthusiast, so I, you know, I can't rattle off some kind of classic car to destroy. But, you know, I just can't imagine if you had some classic 1950 or 1960s car that you would race it around the track and it would destroy it. So everything that you're talking about in terms of it being kind of a controlled environment, controlled race makes perfect sense because uh, I don't think anyone would want to ruin some car that they have either spent a lot of time and money restoring or, you know, buying, <laughs> buying from someone else. <laughs> Uh, I think quite often they do see sort of like red mist and, and sort of go back a few years in their life and pretend that they are F1 drivers when they're not. But <laughs> 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 but really, uh, it's, it's meant to be fun. And we do put in sort of, so if somebody's driving a very old car, there's a waiting, which means that they haven't got to try and match the speed of a more modern car and things like that. So it is really all about a gentlemanly sport, really. Yes, yeah. and that sounds so, so very British as we were talking about, you know, prior to the call. So this is the quintessential <laughs> British experience as perceived by us Americans across the pond. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is, and I think that's that's one thing we'd like to promote really in our in our on our rallies is it is a uh, gentlemanly behavior. We actually do have uh, something written in our terms and conditions that, you know, that is expected throughout the event. Um, because I think it's it's everybody on that event wants to enjoy it. You know, as I say, if you really want to be, um, you know, the hot shoe, you need to go to a race circuit and join one of the race series. Not not try and do it on a on a rally. You know, that's that's not really quite what they're about. Well, do you think there are some myths out there about the whole notion of rallies and traveling via vintage car rallies? Yeah, I think I think there are. I think a lot of people think, you know, just because the cars are old, 1920s or 30s, that maybe they're fragile and not very capable and perhaps they wouldn't be any good at crossing a desert or climbing up mountains and things. Uh, but actually, or, you know, that they may fall to bits in rough terrain or if, or if we race into you. But actually, they're often really just the right vehicle to have um, because when they were built, the, the roads weren't great, often dirt, tr dirt tracks, no tarmac. Um, they, they've got good high ground clearance so that if you do get to sort of a bit bumpy terrain, they can just keep going. They're very capable vehicles, even if they're not as fast as a modern car. And for us as, you know, as organizers, we prefer the older cars because we, we can't support some of the more modern cars because everything's electronic. And you'd need to right. do the diagnostics and you'd need, and there's a lot of sealed units that make up the vehicles nowadays. So, um, we're not able to fix them, but with the old ones, you know, the, the mechanics can solder and mend and bash about. And generally, unless it's, you know, a, a large, um, problem, but generally they can get them to the night halt hotel and then they'd work on them overnight to, to get them ready for the next day. So really, for us, the oh, older ones are quite fun. They're great to see, but um, also they are pretty capable, yeah. Um, well, we have the – I don't know if you've got this concept in the U.K., but um, here in the U.S., people can buy car kits, you know, that look like old cars and put them together, even though, you know, they're not really from the 30s or 40s or, you know, whenever they're they're supposed to be from. Um yeah. Are those kind of cars prevalent in your rallies, or are they actually the genuine thing, you know, that was actually produced in the 20s, 30s, 40s, et cetera? Yeah, we, we have regulations. <clears throat> um, again, it's just really for a sense of fair play, which uh, we categorize the cars according to, to when they were made, and we, we like them all to be made in, in or be at least in production by 68. That covers our sort of transmission and, and the electronic aspects. But there's no um, hierarchy. If somebody wanted to take part in one of our rallies, we don't ask for the, you know, sometimes you have um, like uh, 
car registration passport for some of the racing series to prove that right. you know it was built in time and that engine matches that chassis we don't do that we just ask for it to be in production by or of a type so we're not completely strict on that because um not everybody can afford the original you know real mccoy right and i guess if they're willing to play by the rules in the end yeah. you know everyone's out yeah. for you know the experience and the good time yeah, it really, this really is about experience. It's not about putting things on your CV and things like that. And I think generally our participants are all past that. <laughs> They're all 50 plus. So, um, yeah, I think it is. It's allowing everybody to take part in it. And if you want to do the journey, maybe we're going to a country that you've always wanted to travel through and you don't want to do any competition, we quite often run a touring group, so you'd still have to leave and meet certain timings and they have to be at lunch by a certain time, leave the hotel by a certain time and be in at the end of the day But you don't, and you drive the same route, but you don't have to adhere to the actual timings on the road or, or do any of the circuits. It's really about people enjoying travel and their passion for vehicles with with other people who enjoy the same things. It sounds like it. Now, you mentioned that it was typically people over 50 who were participating. Is that because um, they're in their retirement years and have the actual time to do this, you know, without the encumbrances of, you know, having to raise a family or, you know, get children off of school and that kind of thing? Yeah, I think it definitely is. I think it's... um, Family and children um, are probably the biggest factor. Um, obviously, um, you need to be able to clear your diary for however long, and you need to be able to, uh, you know, afford to actually the entry fee and and all the rest that goes with it. But <clears throat> if it's a once in a lifetime, which quite often it is, then I think you know it's what you prioritise is is what you want to do. You know, we've had people who. Um, you know, it's, it's 40 years wedding anniversary or it's their retirement treat from, from the company they've worked for all their life. Or it's, you know, there's a special reason for doing, doing these events. And I think that's, and I think people can make the time if that's something they've always, if it's one of those things on their bucket list that they've always dreamt of. Well, that's very cool. I'd never thought about it as being a, a retirement gift from a company. Man, it beats the, the watch or the, you know, yeah. time piece or your little trophy, yeah. you know, to, provided you've got the car, you know, to go on the rally, I guess. <laughs> if the company provided the car, that would be super awesome, too. <laughs> well, on some people, some people out in South America, we had one uh, crew who purchased a car in South America, and it was <clears throat> it actually cost them less than if they'd shipped it there, and then at the end of the event, they sold it. So, um they took the risk of not knowing exactly what the car was and how well prepared it was, but um, they decided that that suited them for that event. So, yeah, uh, people come from it from all different directions, really. Other people bring, you know, fantastically expensive, incredible cars just to prove a point that that car can, you know, go across deserts or, you know, various things that nobody would dream of doing. And other people bring a car that their auntie left them and they've nurtured and looked after for the last, 25 years so it's a whole range and everybody is always very pleased to see all the different cars there regardless of of, there's there's never any discussion about value or anything like that everybody's just thrilled to see and and support each other on the fact that they're there you know giving it a go oh absolutely and being able to maybe try out someone else's car or at least you know take a closer look at it yeah yep yep you do see them, you know, on an evening whizzing around in other people's cars. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Well, as, as you're putting together uh, uh, these vintage car rallies, are there questions um, or concerns that people have, maybe fears about participating in something like this? Yeah, I think um, anything that has the word sort of adventure in it or anything related to motorsport obviously should have you know there will be something that uh, highlights an issue because the motor the motorsport aspect is you know not always the safest and uh, adventure travel is often putting people in positions they might not normally be in so i think there are um the fears that we see are like generally with the novices it's like a form of stage fright <clears throat> they might not know what's expected of them or how the day is going to run or 
you know, what signing on means or how scrutineering is going to work. They might not actually know the workings of it. And that in itself is, you know, a bit daunting if you feel everybody else does know and, and you don't. That that can be um, that can be pretty daunting, especially if it's in a country that you've got other issues that it might be the temperature or climate might be very different to your to what you're used to and things like that. So we try and make sure for that that about 18 months before the event, we start putting the information out, telling them about all these different things. And for novices, uh, we make sure that, that they know about the navigation and they don't see it as a dark art and they know what equipment they need to bring and you know how to be comfortable during the day and things like that. For other, other crews who are more experienced, their main fear is being left behind because of a mechanical problem and um, whilst you know the rally might continue without you and some organizers most definitely do that you know they will leave people in various countries and say you know you're on your own and I've been on rallies like that and it is a very uh uncomfortable feeling especially if you don't know the language and suddenly all your support oh, exactly. network has disappeared so we um have brilliant mechanics professional mechanics and fully equipped vehicles that can function anywhere and they mend a huge range of the cars and as I say with the older cars their aim is to get everybody into the night halt so there's always one that runs after the whole rally it's called the sweep and um, you know that's exactly what they do if it's a terminal issue which sometimes there are then we'd make sure that the car and the people get taken to a safe place while we work out how they can continue on the event and uh, try and sort them an alternative vehicle. But again, it depends which country you're in. That's not always uh, a feasible option, but we we do our best. The other thing that we have well, for those crews who, sorry, yeah. Well, I was going to say, I thought I it's about, amazing that you bring mechanics along. Yeah, and for the crews that are worried about being left behind or you know uh, not knowing where we are, where they are, we do we do we stay in touch. We have satellite phones, mobile phones. They have all our numbers, and we track all the cars as well using GPS and the website. So we we know where everybody is. If we need to send a mechanic, we know where where we're sending them. It's not just a, oh we've lost somebody in wherever between here and there. You know we're, we're quite um, uh, clear about where we're sending our support team. Otherwise, it's a waste of, of effort. And that's the same for the medics as well. That and that is the third most common fear is people's health issues traveling in remote and difficult terrains <clears throat> it might be that you know they've lost their general normal medication that they've taken for the last 20 years or it might be that something where we're traveling is um, causing them a, a stress or they might worry about being at altitude and things like that or just being a long way from anywhere a lot of these people have sort of EAs and PAs and this huge support network in their normal life. And then you travel to fairly remote places and that all peels away and they're like, crikey, you know, they suddenly feel that they're out in the middle of nowhere, which they are. But we have <laughs> medics with us. <laughs> and um, we have medics who are experts in their field and very experienced at working in the remote areas. And we also know about Everybody's medical, we don't. In the office here, we don't, but the medics know about any sort of uh, pre-existing conditions. And we also carry a lot of information where we're traveling, like hospitals, dentists, all things like that, so that if we needed to you know, renew a supply, we can. And then it goes through from that to sort of, if we ever needed it, which we haven't, thank goodness, um, you know, how we would medivac somebody out. So that becomes like a process and procedure, really. So those are the common fears, stage fright, being left behind, and a health issue. That's, that, that's what I'd say most people worry about. Well, it really sounds like you take care of people from soup to nuts, but I can imagine that there are, except, especially if you're novices, there may be some little-known pitfalls or mistakes that uh, some of these novices make when you know they first enter a rally like this. Can you talk about some of those and how they overcame them or avoided or you how you how they can avoid them? Yeah, we as I say we try and give everybody <clears throat> we try and make sure that when somebody starts one of these events that they are even if they've never done it before, they're fully aware of how the competition works, what all the different signs look like, how to recognise a marshal versus a media person, you know, and all these things. We try and make sure that um 
everybody's up to speed because they don't really want them to go along for two or three days trying to learn how it works because by that time they've dropped out of any competition. You know, we want everybody to start in the competition, try and stay in the competition. So then uh, we, we do do pretty well, but there are a few people who've turned up and surprised us where we had one crew turn up and um, that when they went through scrutineering, they didn't have any tools at all and their boot was just filled with red wine. And, um, <laughs> oh, they were going to have a great time. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds quite funny and you think, oh, well, well done, good, good on you. But, you know, when you're doing 15,000 kilometers and you haven't got any tools and that's that's all you've got for your own provision, is it does it did throw up a few problems. But um, we managed to get them some water as well to carry that as well in case they needed it. <laughs> Well, there's this whole thing about driving while intoxicated. It might be a small problem unless they were going to, you know, drink after they stop. Let's hope that was the. That was the <laughs> I think it was for evening consumption. They were worried that we weren't going to get any quality wine, so they bought their own. Uh-huh. <laughs> Don't forget the good wine. Never mind ten... the tools, you know. <laughs> yeah, you can just imagine the conversation, which might have been funny, but you know, a lot of these things is you are traveling through unknown. You know, normally these people haven't travelled through some of these countries, and it is it is advisable to have you know a jack or something to change a tyre or some spare oil. But there you go. We've had another couple who turned up again for um, a similar length, you know, f- you know, fifteen thousand kilometres, um, in a car that they hadn't even sat in. So, although we'd sent them all the information on what was expected, they'd sort of done it remotely, which again sounds okay. But it comes down to sort of are you going to be comfortable and um, they weren't. You know, they hadn't sat in the car and, and you know, day after day is, is, is you do need to be comfortable. So those are the, those are the two that spring to mind when you, you talk about that. Well, you can, as the saying goes, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. You can't make them follow the instructions that you send them, <laughs> uh, despite how many times you send them and, and beg them to read them. <laughs> yeah, and you say there is an advice page and there is this, you know, we're here to help. But yeah, I suppose everybody sees things differently, don't they? They probably think, well, we're well-traveled and this will be fine for us. But, um, you know, often it is and sometimes it isn't. <laughs> well, well, we do try and tell rally. everybody. Say again. What's that? Are you tr- as I say, you try and tell everybody. Yeah, we try and, you know, give them the heads up on things, sort of, you know, visas required, health, is- health issues for the region or political issues that might have arisen since, you know, the beginning of the organizing. Right. How to prepare their cars and how to prepare themselves. Uh, really, it's the preparation is what will win a rally, and it's also how you get the most out of taking part in a rally. You know, be aware of what's going to come your way and, you know, are you happy with it and can you manage it? So, And are you going to enjoy it? Absolutely. Well, how many participants do you typically have in a rally? Um, it really depends where we're going and one of the factors is how remote we are and where, um, you know, what, what hotels or what accommodation we can find. So for the, for the very remote places, it's generally about 25 cars is our maximum. But then we took um, 52 crews to Japan because we had the accommodation available. So it really depends where we're going. Oh, that's amazing. Well, it is smaller than I'd envisioned. I was thinking, you know, two or 300 people. How would you organize that? But it's not that large. <laughs> no, no. Um, I think, you know, on some of them you can. I think the biggest, biggest one we did, yeah, was 60, 65 crews, but that was in Europe. But I think there does come a critical mass where we as organizers wouldn't know who everybody was and you'd lose some of the customer service aspect of it. Oh, I can imagine, right. Have you ever had the situation <laughs> where someone joins in mid, mid-rally and just tries to sneak in as you're going through a particular destination? They may have heard of it and said, Oh well, this sounds. This looks cool. Let me just get in the parade. <laughs> we haven't had anybody joining in with the cars, but we've had people trying to join in on on the evening meals. <laughs> ah, <laughs> the party aspect, but, you know, of course, that always attracts people. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. No, I think um, when we go to some places, you sort of park the cars up in the town um, centre for people to come and have a look. Yeah, I think it is something, you know, it's pretty cool to see some of these old cars and where they've been and, you know, uh, and what they're doing and and that they're still out there doing it. Um, And and some of the people as well, you know, they've got fantastic stories to say, to tell, and and not everybody's there because it's their their way of spending their money. It might be, you know, as I say, it's a a once-in-a-lifetime trip. And, yeah, And, and for them it's great to chat to local people and, it gives them a lift round, you know. We've, we had that in Bhutan in, in the Himalayas where we stayed in a village in a fantastic valley where it isn't really open to tourism as much and there was just one small guest house but the local farms opened their own homes to our group and um, some of the participants slept in the farmer's shrine rooms and there was no, no language communication and no facilities in in the rooms and we brought all of the bedding and things from uh, from one of the big towns as near as we could and the next morning it was very cold and frosty and it was a huge amount of fun I think it was about 7.30 in the morning and all the farmers were in the different cars being driven around by the drivers <laughs> and the navigators and no language and everybody having just a great time so yeah it's, it is right. it's really good fun <laughs> yeah I was just Slightly picturing that surreal. in my mind and I'm I bet they were having a blast. <laughs> yeah, slightly surreal, but you know, that's that's the adventure aspect of it. Um, it does take you to some amazing places. Well, speaking of amazing places, however, do you choose the the destinations for the rallies? Is it by interest indi- indicated by your participants, or where you want to travel, or some combination thereof? Uh, yeah, it's a combination actually. The, we were the first ones to go into um, uh, Myanmar, into Burma, when they lifted the reporting resti- restrictions. And um, I'd heard that on the radio and thought, crikey, that would be amazing. And so that was the reason for that was uh, it was very new and only just opening up, and that was fantastic. So that was the road to Mandalay. We, you know, we were the first ones in to do that. Japan was. Um, some participants had said uh, that it would be lovely and perhaps Japan would be suitable. And uh, as an organiser, it, it was a wonderful country to travel and, and see because you know, it was stable, it was safe, um, fantastic culture. Uh, all, all in all, it was brilliant, a brilliant event. And we are actually going back to Japan. Um, I'm going away at the weekend to do a recce for something called the Trans Himalayan Adventure, which is taking 25 vintage and classic cars from Chengdu in China up uh, into Tibet to Lhasa and then across the central plateau and to far west Tibet and then back down into Nepal and back down into the plains of India and finishing in Varanasi. And that's an incredible journey because quite often people go into the Himalayas and go up and along the south face but we're actually we're actually taking this these crews and their cars you know up and over the Himalayas and down the other side which I think is quite amazing really <laughs> oh I think it is too it sounds phenomenal <laughs> so, well, Liz, I so can really tell take... you love what you do. yeah I, I just I can tell think, what you well, love that... what you do yeah, that one is like, well, let's do it. Let's go up and over rather than just along, you know. So, um, and the authorities in China have been amazing and opened up some areas that aren't normally available to tourism. And so, part of where we're going in, in far west Tibet is a bit like Indiana Jones territory, and you know, no tourism there. So, we're very lucky to be driving our own vehicles uh, in such a privileged place. So, yeah. It is that one is great, and seeing these things sort of fall into place, and you sit. You know, my job's the imaginator, and I sit and I think, "Wow, wouldn't it be amazing if?" And then you know, <laughs> suddenly you, you get offered up these it things, is. and you think, "You think, wow, that's brilliant! Yeah, let's try it." <laughs> very, very cool. So that's where I'll be for the next five weeks is surveying the route and uh, doing all the necessary there with our route designer. So yeah. Ah, wow. Well, I can I can hear the love of what you do as you tell these 
awesome stories, and we talked to her, <laughs> mentioned a little bit about that this in the beginning, you know, and with your bio. But what inspired you to become a rally organizer? I think um, I suppose I, I've been a navigator for my husband, and then um, for our honeymoon, we d- we did a rally. We did the peaking to Paris. Uh, which is a tough, very tough one. And um, th- th- I felt there wasn't enough time to see the different countries we were traveling through and what they had to offer. And we did sort of 36 days nonstop against the clock, just concentrating on competition and where we had to be next. And um, we went through beautiful countries where we may never go back. And I felt it was a bit sad not to see and sample, you know, the, the food or, or the, you know, the, the different markets or the architecture or, you know, what, what local dancing goes on or something like that. And that was the main thing was um, being told we didn't have enough time um, was very frustrating. And I thought also there's perhaps an opportunity for um, a bit more customer care and customer service. So I think that's true on quite a few of the rallies I've done. You know, it didn't matter whether it's Iran or or Italy, and um, and I met with somebody else on that rally who felt the same, you know, and he had an auction house, and um, so we chatted about it at various times, and we worked together originally, and um, that's how it was a quick way to get it to market, but um, then he decided to carry on with his auction house, and his health, unfortunately, wasn't brilliant, and so then I carried on um, doing the rallies, so that's how it sort of came about. It was a bit organic, really. I didn't sit at the kitchen table and say, that's what I'm going to do. It sort of came around, really. I, I, I have a bit of a have-a-go attitude, and I thought I'd have a go. <laughs> well, you know, so many great business ideas come from your own experiences and what you see lacking in those, you know, and you think, I can do better than that. Yeah. And, and I it think sounds having... like you have. <laughs> <laughs> I think having done, having been a competitor and seen it from that 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 side of the fence definitely definitely makes me more aware of as an organizer what it is that we're trying to achieve definitely that 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 definitely is a i think a great great asset yeah yeah well if I think somebody also is... quite go ahead i'm quite a logical and methodical and organized person um, I don't like too much risk, but I do like adventure. So I think all of that comes into play in it as well, like the pre-planning. And, you know, it takes two years for us to put these events together. And I really enjoy being part of a professional team. And so I think actually when you look at it, you think, well, no, that's probably not what I thought I would be doing um, when the children left home. But there you are. It's it's It does seem to fit and suit. <laughs> it sounds like it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, if, somebody, if somebody is considering participating in this kind of event, are there questions that they should ask themselves or, you know, be, be on the lookout for or ask the a rally organizer before making that decision to participate in a particular rally? Yeah, I think I think there are. And so there's a whole range of different styles of rallies. Um, there's the Fast and Furious um there's the, the, the more road racing rallies. You know, the, it, you have to have a look at the type of rally that you want to do. And then if you were to think actually it's including adventure travel, then the question I would ask myself is, am I happy to do this amazing journey with the person who I've chosen to sit next to me? Are, they, are we going to get on, you know, sitting next to each other? Are we going to make a good crew? Are we both going to enjoy it to the full and what happens when it gets tough. And I think that's the first thing is who you're sitting next to. And it doesn't, I'm not saying um, husband and wife because, you know, I've done you know, ladies rallies, you know, with just all girls crews and things like that. I think it's the person you're traveling with can have the biggest effect on your experience on the rally. Oh, I can, I can imagine, you know, because if the person next to you is miserable, man, it makes it difficult not to be miserable right there with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, open the door and shove them out. <laughs> well, yeah, that, I wasn't going to say that, but that would be my other thought. <laughs> I think it is. It, it's, it, you want you want a fantastic experience, so you have to be 
realistic about that person. And if if you're thinking of doing it with your spouse and they can't abide cars or hot countries or, you know, whatever it is that's coming, then do it with a good friend instead and have a wonderful time. You know, I think the next question would be to the rally organisers is, you know, about their safety record and, and what level of support they're going to provide. And then, then you'd know... You know, do I have to be able to rebuild and change a clutch and do all of these things or do I just have to do the basics and there'll be somebody there to help me with the others? You know, know, know what you've put yourself in for. So know what your support team can offer you um, and therefore you still, you know, generally you've got time to go and do, you know, if you've never changed your wheel, you obviously have to learn how to do that, but you've got time to go and learn some skills that might be relevant. So that's what I would say is, you know, what what level of support are you going to get? Well, would you say that there is really um, one thing that um, a classic car rally should consider when they're considering whether or not to choose the rally, like one one most important thing? Um, in choosing a rally? Right. I think it just has – yeah, I think it has to be um, – be realistic with yourself about what you're going to get the most enjoyment from. That's what I'd say because you know, if you're going to if you're going to go for a tough rally where they're going to leave you behind and you've then got to sort out your own transport in Mongolia through to Russia while you catch up the rally, is that something you're going to be happy doing or, you know, are you wanting to do something where you know there's going to be somebody coming along after everybody so that if you sit still, don't worry, somebody will be there. You know, what level of adventure um, is it that you're looking for really, and you know where do you want to travel? <laughs> yeah yeah for me i guess that would be I, the biggest one where where are you going and do i want to be there <laughs> yeah do you want to be there you know um yeah i think that i think there's lots of things but i think it's it's this is uh a unique opportunity for people to combine their love of cars and travel and it's about following your passion and your heart and so you have to be a bit sort of um selfish in your decision making to make sure that you do you know you maximize your your experience right yeah and i don't i don't think that's yeah i don't think that's um you know if it's once in a lifetime and you think you know if you're a parent how much caring you've done or if you're a carer for somebody else how much caring you've done or you've worked for however many years or decades doing a job um I think sometimes you can allow yourself you know, a dream and if this is your dream then you know you can work towards perhaps somehow making it a reality. Right. And you want to do your homework ahead of time because who wants a dream that that's the worst experience of their lives, you know, whether they chose the wrong traveling companion or the wrong car or the wrong destination. Um, you yep. don't want your your item on your bucket list to be really bad, <laughs> a really bad experience. No, you're absolutely right. I think it's it's definitely preparation is 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 everything, and it's you know sometimes it's hard decisions, isn't it? You know, absolutely. I, you might not get on with your spouse, or they might not listen if you're giving instructions. So that's not going to work, is it? If you're the one giving the instructions for left and right, and they don't want to hear you, then perhaps that's not going to be the best crew to take. You know, so sometimes you do need to sort of make a bit of a tough decision, but it can work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have one chap who navigate uh, who ra- drives and his navigator is his wife's best friend and they make an amazing crew and his wife's always thrilled because she doesn't want to do the event um and they come home and there's you know we give everybody a book at the end and a dvd and a film of of the journey and um it's something that they can take part in and and go home and say you know this is what we've done so yeah it works awesome well, Liz, I have so enjoyed talking to you today about Rally Round and these rallies that you're doing. How can somebody find out more about you and Rally Round Limited and how you can help them? Okay, well, we have a website, which is rallyround.co.uk. And um, on there, there's you, you can look up the rallies that you might be interested in and send in a inquiry form when we pick that up. Or they can email me direct on... Uh, 
liz.wenman at rallyround.co.uk, which is a bit of a mouthful, which can be found on the team page on, on the website. Um, more than happy. And even if it's just a preliminary inquiry or, you know, a long way off for somebody before retirement or whatever, we're more than happy to uh, help. Or maybe they're doing a rally somewhere and they just like a bit more help from um, you know, another organiser who might have been there or who might have some thoughts. We're always here for that. I think that's the reason for the name as well, Rally Round, is, you know, we rally round to make sure everybody gets to the end and we'll rally round to make sure it's a great event for people. It's not it's not just um cutthroat competition. Awesome. I had not thought about that, but that is a great name. <laughs> well, thanks <laughs> thanks Liz for being our guest today on Main Street Mavericks Radio and I appreciate all of you who are listening to today's episode. Take care. We'll see you soon on our next episode of Main Street Mavericks Radio. You've been listening to Main Street Mavericks Radio with Donna Gunter. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit MainStreetMavericks.com.